Okay. Cha, yes, on the air. Uh, so let's switch the topic. Next, our next topic will be related to Internet of Things, IoT, and uh, for this part, I'm uh, speaking on behalf of Industry Hack, which is one of the uh, startups that I'm associated with as a founder. <clears throat> Think about the future. I think, and I see that everybody's pretty connected in the world as of today, where everybody having these kind of a, all kinds of gadgets. There's 10 billion these as of today. Think about the world five years ahead from now. There's going to be 50 billion connected devices by year 2020. That's the starting point because Within the same time frame, in five years, by year 2020, there will be 212 billion sensors connecting into these devices. This world will be five years from now look really, really different compared to what it is today. And uh, to give you an idea how the world will look like, I would like to share a video with you to inspire you and encouraged to think about the future. So let's see the video. So, so, if you thought that IoT was just about machine to machine, it's not. It's the internet of everything. Our next speaker will be Cedric Georgi from Sigfox. So let's welcome Georgi. Welcome. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. Um, so I have 12 minutes to get you quite excited about the Internet of Things, if you're not already, and uh, 12 minutes to explain a little bit what we call the LP1, so the Low Power Wide Area Network. 
I'm Cédric Giorgi, I'm coming from France, sorry for the French accent, uh, I'll do my best with this. Um, I'm the head of developer and startup relations at Sigfox, and uh, I'm here to find more makers and developers who want to join a wonderful journey in IoT. First, a few things, and actually it's a good um, link with, uh, with the video you had before, is some definition of Internet of Things. You won't see any hype cycle we usually have in any Internet of Things uh, presentation because it's at the hype of the hype. Um, I want to make sure we, we talk about the right things. Don't think about connected objects when looking at IoT. Think about things, anything, everything, things we can connect, um, our environment, our places, our cities, our factories, anything, not just connected objects you're going to have in your house. And not even new things. And uh, exactly what David Rose is explaining with enchanted objects. Uh, how do we connect existing things just by adding a few sensors, making sure they will produce data, and making sure they become connected and um, enchanted objects and things? Also, quite a, I'm, I will focus on one part, which is what we call um, like sensor-based system. In IoT, you can define two worlds. Um, the one is you want to build very complex solutions, complex objects. You have a lot of, um, of power within the object. It's like robotics. You kind of very powerful device that will detect your heels, that will play music depending on your mood. All these things are more with AI. And then you have a very interesting part, especially for the industrial Internet of Things, which is more relying on very simple sensors that will produce data, and you will create a service and data out of it. And in that world, at the end, it's really simple what you have to build. Um, and you have three pillars. To build a system like this, you need connectivity, you need energy, and you need data source. Data source, it can be producing data, but also getting data from the internet. That's the three pillars for IoT. And then a lot of startups are trying to disrupt uh, all these different categories, creating new kind of sensors. Uh, there's a startup over there doing a sensor to detect anything on textile. You have on in the energy part, you will find energy harvesting. That's one of the buzzwords you will, you will hear as well, to make sure we can produce data from anything. Um, and connectivity, and that's the part I will focus uh, during the rest of the presentation. Right now, these are the main, of course, we'll, you'll find more, but these are the main um, connectivity solutions you will find. And they're organized by two uh, axes. One is the energy consumption you're going to have, and the other one is the range. Range is important because in some situations, you will be fine with a 20-meter range. Like I have a Bluetooth de de um, device. It will be connected to my phone, and I'm fine with it. But then what if I want my device to be completely independent? What if I want to have something very simple like this? This is a real device connected wherever am I. Uh, no, connected, no connection to my, to my Wi-Fi gateway, no connection to my Bluetooth. This is independent. Then we have two solutions that are at the complete right of the, of the axis. Um, there's GSM, very long range. It works wherever you are. That's fine. Problem with GSM, and that is the problem in the previous world of IoT, you know, M2M. It's not very sexy anymore, machine to machine, but that's actually the, the name we were using in that industry before the, the new name came. But um, the problem is this on GSM, it will last like three days, seven days. So there's a new category, and it's called LP1. Uh, low power wide area network uh, with a very long range possibility, and it will increase the battery life for devices by 100 times. It's not like a guess, it's a real category. Sigfox were one of them, and, um, and it's right now live. So, um, to give you some example of use case, and I'm going to have more in, in, later on in, in the presentation, um, these are all use cases where you don't need a lot of data, but you need to make sure it will last for years. Like, um, uh, a connected bin uh, when you want to do some waste management and you want to make sure your truck will come only when it's full, but you don't want to change the battery every week or so. So you want to make sure the sensor you're putting with, with your bin will be during two years. Like a dog, of course a dog, if you're doing a tracker with a BLE device, it won't work uh, because you won't give a phone to your dog or something. So you want to have a connected, um, connected thing that will last uh, independently. These are some use cases. Yes. So uh, just we have three slides about Sigfox. Uh, don't go in much into details about who we are. We're 150 people. We raised quite a big of money. We're in 12 countries. I'm going to speak about it. But to give you the idea of what it is to be relying on low-power wide area network, completely new category. 
First, we have wireless technology, long range. Our job is to install base station. So that's a telco name, so basically an antenna on top of a roof um, to make sure the area is covered. And um, the good part of our low power is that it goes long range. To give you an idea, we connected France with 1,500 base stations only. If you take GSM, it's 30,000. Quite, quite a difference. Second, second part of the technology, and that's why it's so focused on sensors and specific needs, we're having only small messages, 12 bytes. 12 bytes, not only kilobytes, like really 12 by 8 bits. And the first reaction will be, ah, 12 bytes, I cannot do much with, uh, with 12 bytes. Actually, you can do a lot of things within 12 bytes. You can put two full GPS positions and coordinates. Uh, I can have uh, 96 times bit, so one, one, uh, zero or one. So when I have a button, uh, I, can, I can have uh, many, many possibilities. You can do temperature data, you can put accelerators, many, many things. And the good thing about having small messages is that your battery, as I said many, many times, uh, will be uh, way longer. What we're doing is we're bringing a global IoT network. In case you have a, uh, haven't heard of us because we're not yet in Finland, uh, we're in 12 countries. We'll be uh, covering the 10 biggest US cities by the end of Q1, already in France, Spain, Holland, uh, UK. Uh, you see a list of, uh, of countries here. I'm quite excited to say that Pretty soon, not saying when, uh, but we'll go, we're going to be in Finland uh, with our friends at um, Helsinki Ventures and also a startup I'm going to mention who has been the trigger for us to come here and actually being here at Slash. So easy to use, out of the box, that's uh, very simple, no SIM card. Um, it's, uh, if you're a developer, um, oops, I cannot go back, yeah. Um, if you're a developer, the, the good part is that it's relying on API and callbacks. Um, so it's, it's a dream, very simple, uh, no error to manage as on GSM. I mean, it's been made by developers for developers. Um, some of the benefits, uh, but I, I, I will make sure I, I talk about the opportunities. So wh what can we do with a low provider network? We can do this. This is a startup called Winat. What they do is they put sensors um, in, in fields, completely independent, so that the farmer will be able to say, oh, in this specific area, I need to put water or not, I need to put fertilizer or not, because you have temperature in the ground, outside uh, sensor, you have uh, humidity, moisture, all these um, sensors are go going directly from the device. Another example, which is kind of a, a very, very big market coming from the end to end, uh, it's uh, water metering, telemetering. Why do we have these people? I don't know if it's the case in, in, in Finland, but in France, we still have um, all these people twice a year. You have to organize uh, um, a meeting. They come between 9 and 1 p.m., and you have to stay at home just because they have to come and write four numbers. This is completely crazy. What if you have a sensor? You put it on top of your water meter, and every day it will send the consumption of water that you have. Not only spend, I mean, sparing money for the, for, the, for the water company, but also creating more, more services like if I have it every day or every hour, if I have the water consumption, then I can detect something that, that goes wrong because during six months, there's no consumption between 11 p.m. and 7 a.m., let's say. And then suddenly it starts to consume a little bit every night. So maybe I have something I need to repair in my house. This is the kind of thing that you can do when you have more data. A few minutes left. Um, GPS tracker. Small, small startup out of France doing hidden seek. Um, you get the GPS position out of uh, the GPS satellite, you send it on an LP1 network, and then you create a tracker like this during two years on battery life. I, I have one in my scooter in Paris to make sure it's not stolen. Uh, actually, when it's stolen, I know where to find. Also, because it's not plugged to anything, so the, the thief won't unplug as you will do in a car where anything electronic will be completely unplugged when, when stolen. Um, two minutes left. Um, just another example of very non-sexy stuff where you put a sensor on top of this, I don't remember the name in English, but uh, to, for firemen to make sure they have water. What if they come and then there's no water when there's a fire some, somewhere? They need to make sure that everything is fine and they want to put sensors on such things and, um, and then they, they will save life with this. Um, connected uh, smoke detector, another example in a house. Um, the thing is, of course, it will sound and ring when it, when it doesn't work anymore or there will be a light. Many often you won't hear it. What if it's connected and just every day 
it will send one bit to say, I'm fine. In the industrial world, a lot of machines will be like this, connected just with one bit a day. And um, the one I have here, it's pretty much the same. So this is a Finnish startup. Um, our job is also to make sure we have an ecosystem around us. We don't do any hardware at Sigfox. We just do the connectivity. So we're here to enable dreams from entrepreneurs. Uh, yeah, just that, enable dreams. Uh, and this is the perfect example for Sigfox and for LP1. Just one bit. I just press it, and it will send um, on, on Sigfox. OK, not here in Finland. Again, we're not yet here. But um, actually, we just have one base station nearby, so it might work. Uh, and it will send on the back end. And then I can, det I can say, if I press, I want to order a taxi uh, here in Finland. In Helsinki, they have some winning on GSM. The problem is they need to be plugged or recharged every week, as I explained. The, 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 the main idea I want you to keep in, in, in mind is that it's a new world of opportunities. If you were in the web industry back in 2005, we were all talking about Web 2.0. Um, I'm not even allowed to say it's on stage, but uh, it's only because I'm talking about history that uh, I say Web 2.0. Now it's 2015, and hardware entrepreneurs and hardware tech and IoT and industrial IoT is a real, real journey uh, for entrepreneurs, many opportunities. Just three tips I can, I can give. Um, hardware is hard. That's a, it's a joke we all have, even if it's now simpler because of uh, prototyping, because of new possibilities on the cloud. And you're going to have um, Amazon Web Service explaining also what they can help you with. But it still remains hard. So don't, don't forget the hardware part. Then we have uh, the value is in the service and data. The first step is your hardware, your sensor. This is uh, what I have here in my pocket. So uh, I have this produce, that's fine. Um, I have temperature data coming from that. But the real value I'm going to bring to the market is how I change this data into a service, into uh, a, real, uh, um, a, a real product. And last, yes, last slide, uh, because not only because we are part of this session, the industrial internet, uh, look at B2B opportunities, forget all the sexiness of B2C launching on Kickstarter and Digogo, even if we load them. Uh, but 90% of the market in IoT is B2B industrial. And I'm happy to help you with or answer questions. You have my contact details. Thank you very much. Yep. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Cedric. Good stuff. Uh, as you saw, Button and uh, Sigforce really have uh, solved some of the problems in transport transporting some of those transactions. And, uh, uh, taken by the customers. Now we're going to have a, a, a look at the cloud side of things uh, in the Internet of thing, Things, and uh, there's a powerhouse called Amazon. And uh, we're going to have uh, the next speaker, uh, who's Carlos Conde, uh, who's the head of uh, industrial and consumer IoT at Amazon Web Services. So let's give a big, big hand to Carlos. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you. So I'm going to talk about the, the other part of Amazon, the one that perhaps uh, less people know about, which is the, the processing and storing data. But before, I wanted to come back to one of the early projects we did was, uh, was around smart cities. And at the time, uh, I think the main point was to solve the, the parking problem. So this is a, this is a project in, uh, in Spain. And as you can see, it was solved with a very, very let's say, uh, IoT-ish way, putting metal sensors on the ground, connecting those metal sensors to GPS coordinates. And every time you have a car parking above the sensor, you can plot it on a GPS on a, on a map. right? And then the next step was to have um, an application on a mobile device where you can say, well, drive me to the next empty parking location. And then you have, you have the guidance. So that was the first kind of um, IoT or smart city application, which was four years ago. And four years ago, the other trend was doing, um, was doing uh, the, the, the sensors around, um, around atmosphere and around air quality. And here you can see that one of the interesting projects was this one in Budapest, where the sensor is on the top of a bus. Because if you want to have a good resolution and a good level of information around what's the air quality on a city, either you put sensors every 50 meters on the city, and then you end up with the challenge of maintaining all those sensors, or you put those sensors on a bus so that those buses are moving around. 
and you have the side effect of having also the GPS information. So now you can have an application that gives to your users the information in real time where the bus is. OK, so that was, let's say, uh, old generation uh, IoT. Even if we see like applications like this, those, uh, those applications are all about collecting the data and then showing the data. So it's, uh, it's perhaps IoT from the last, uh, last four years. Now, the platform you have to build in order to build IoT is first you have a gateway that collects the devices. So I'm, I'm talking about the backend infrastructure part. So the speaker just before me showed you how you can get the data to the backend. Once you are at the backend, so of course you have the, the SDK that is the, the, the technical language, the library that allows your device to talk with the backend. All this in a secure channel. Then the other component that you need to build is the rules engine. So the engine that is processing your different messages. Um, those messages are then connected to other, other systems, like machine learning. I'm going to show you this uh, uh, later. And you have another component that is almost always forgotten, which is the device shadowing system. Sometimes the connectivity is not going to work. Or for example, here in the, in the case of a, of a connected bus, is going to go under a tunnel, so there's no connectivity. And you're going to get the information later. So your system should be able to handle that. And at the end, well, this is your complete platform that you need to build. The last component is the registry, which allows you to manage remotely and connect or disconnect some devices. You, you may have rogue devices. You may want to update remotely devices. So you need to keep track of all those devices you have in mind. So this is a complete IoT backend platform, uh, the modern way. So let's see now what you can do with, um, with all this. One of the first projects we did uh, three years ago, available in the US, is uh, the Amazon Dash button. So I assume everyone here is familiar with Amazon.com, the e-commerce website. And the idea was to make it even easier for people to buy things uh, on Amazon. So especially regular things, like if you need detergent, if you need coffee, well, just press a button. You know the brand you're using. You know how much you have. And, and that was the whole point of the, of the Dash button. Um, then. Now, about two years ago, we launched, uh, well, one year ago, we launched, uh, um, uh, we launched uh, Alexa, Amazon, Alex Amazon Echo. The name of the device is, uh, is Alexa, which is kind of a, a connected, a personal assistant embedded on a, uh, on a speaker. So you can, you can talk to the, to the device. You can ask him, of course, things like the temperature. Uh, the, the news, you can ask him to read you an article, and he's going to fetch information uh, based on different backends and, give, and read the information back to you. So it's like a, an IoT device where you're interacted with, uh, with voice. Right? And this is one of the first generation of devices where actually the UI is not your mobile phone anymore. The, the device is, is in your environment, and you can interact it in a more natural way. So, a, a consequence of this is another project that we saw. Actually, if you take the, if you take the, the button that I showed you earlier, or, or the, the previous one you saw, you can implement a project like this. The GlowCap was a, a very interesting one that is coming in Europe that helps you solve a specific problem in healthcare, which is the one of uh, patients that forget to, to take their drugs, to take their pills. right? And um, in, some, in some diseases, especially like uh, Alzheimer, one of the side effects is uh, of course, you're losing memory, so you forget when you have to take the medicine. And um, the diagram shows here the, the scale of the problem. So each line is a person, and every time there's a red dot, the person missed, missed a dose. He forgot to take the medicine. So you can see also the economic impact of this. Because here you have a patient that went to the doctor. So, uh, so he had the, the, the social coverage, pay for the, the, the appointment with the doctor. Uh, pay for the medicine, but then it doesn't take the medicine, so it doesn't get cured, and it even gets worse, right? So with this very simple device that just glows and emits a, a sound every time you need to take it, because it's remote control by the uh, by the doctor or by the pharmacy, which puts like the schedule of every time you need to take your uh, your medicine, the adherence is way higher, and now suddenly you don't have people forgetting to take the medicine anymore, and this is something that you can quantify. Uh, in, in financial terms, you can definitely see the impact of people not, uh, don't, not forgetting to take their medicine. OK, same for the, uh, for the Human Genome Project. So this one started, costed uh, billions of dollars. Now you can, uh, you can have a machine like this one, a sequencer that can sequence the whole human genome in about 30 hours and generate like a, a data strand of uh, 300 gigabytes. 
And as also previous speakers uh, mentioned, it's now the point is not about having the device generating the data, but it's really building the platform that analyzes the data. So Illumina, the company who built the sequencers, now they are turning a little bit into a company that is offering data processing. The value is not in sequencing the human DNA. The value is providing a platform that allows you to, in, uh, to analyze and to interact with uh, the DNA that you have sequenced. So a couple of trends that are happening now in the present is, of course, coupling IoT with mobile. So this is a kind of a strange example. I'm, I'm, I'm not a big fan of like, having connected toothbrush, but I think it really illustrates the point. That is, the, the toothbrush itself doesn't have any, any UI that allows you to configure it and to get the information. So now, mobile devices are used in means to provide the UI for, uh, for, those, uh, uh, for those connected devices as well. So you have many, uh, many implementations of these, many variations like uh, uh, smart sensors. But another way to look at using mobile devices with IoT is using mobile devices as a let's say, physical HTTP cookies, right? So HTTP cookies allow you to track users um, in the internet. And uh, you can use mobile devices to track also users in the physical world. So you can, use, you can do many different things, like uh, seeing the density of populations around some areas in the city, or for example, in a car, even with Bluetooth sensors that are not connected to an antenna, you could measure the distance between two, two receptors and derive the speed of the car. Of course, the use case is not to send automatically a, a, a fine, but it's just to understand where you have traffic jams or where you have potential accidents. Because now you can derive the speed going through a, a specific section uh, of the highway. Now, that was still the old world of IoT, which is collecting, processing, displaying information. Now we are moving more into learning and applying machine learning principles in order to act with the data itself. And, um, this is a, a picture of a warehouse uh, of uh, Amazon.com. Uh, it's, it's a bit of the old ones, but it shows how it works. That is, uh, you have a warehouse that works a little bit like an IKEA store. Every time you order a, a parcel from Amazon, uh, the person you see on the bottom, the, the pickers, they are walking around the warehouse and uh, composing your, your parcel. So now the way it works is uh, by using devices. So, we have those robots that are essentially autonomous robots. They are connected with each other, then talk with each other, and they are basically carrying those racks that have uh, roughly the same size as, a, as an IT rack that is meant to, uh, to carry servers. So you can see on the video, they walk under the rack, and they are going to lift it, and they are going to bring it back to the, to the picker. So the, the benefit of this is that now you don't have to you don't have to move people around the warehouse anymore. That is, uh, the, the racks come directly to the people. And now you have a warehouse that organizes itself almost organically. Right? That is, the, the robots themselves, they are, moving the, they are moving the different items closer to the pickers if those items are very popular. That is, if tomorrow we have the new Harry Potter book, so those racks are going to move and uh, move closely, closer to the, uh, to the pickers in order to minimize the travel distance. And this is done completely auton uh, autonomously. You see those uh, streets that are created inside the warehouse that are done like completely, completely alone. That is, no one is telling those robots, hey, you should build the street in this way. They self-organize the, the warehouse themselves. OK, so those robots, you can even buy them. Like, at least the, the, the reduced model and uh, program them with uh, Arduinos. There's many, many kits that are available today to get started that allows you to connect information. And at the end, you have everything needed. So my, the whole point that I wanted to highlight here is that the previous speaker showed how you can get the information to a data center or to a, to a cloud. Now what we provide is the ability to store and to process the information. So you have all the tools in order to build anything. Thank you. Mm-hmm.